Welcome everyone to the webinar. We will get into our discussion about simplifying NFPA 70 compliance in just a moment. I first wanted to introduce our panel today. My name is Jim Kennessy. I'm the marketing manager here at Meltric. Bridget Davidson is our regional sales manager for the South region, and she will be our presenter today. Brent Kirk, who is our regional sales manager for the Northwest, will serve you know, as our panelist and be actively moderating our, our Q&A box. Both Bridget and Brent have a wealth of experience in the industry and have helped many organizations work through simplifying NFPA 70 compliance. Um, but before I turn it over to Bridget, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. Because of the size of the audience, we do have the attendees muted. Therefore, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box on the, on the top right of your control panel. You can pose questions as they come up and Brent will handle those um, to the best of his ability. We will also have the opportunity to address questions at the end. As with most of webinars, we are recording this one and we will make it available for everyone to review after the presentation. So without further ado, um, I would like to turn over the presentation to Bridget. Hello everyone, thank you for attending today. Um, I'm gonna start to address code compliance and there are two different kinds of industry electrical codes. Um, most people are familiar with NAC code and how equipment is installed, but many people that are involved in the ongoing maintenance of, of equipment need to follow NFPA 70E standards in the workplace. So today I'm going to be teaching you guys a little bit about NFPA 70E and how it's followed. It's important that we start to look at NFPA 70E and its implications because there has been an increase of electrical injuries in the workplace in recent years. There's a trend upward. So we want to bring that back down. Um, obviously, when people are injured, that is a problem. And the more people that are injured, a bigger problem we have. So we're going to start a poll now um, that you guys can answer. In 2019, Lockout Tagout was the fourth overall OSHA citation. From 2019 to 2021, there have been an average of 2,123 citations per year. How comfortable are you with your organization's lockout tagout procedure? Do you feel very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, you're not sure, or you would like us to please not call OSHA because you know it's it's not very good. The poll is open and I'll wait for a few minutes while you guys answer those the question. Okay, uh, we got pretty much all the, the votes in. Um, what, what we're seeing is 31% is are very comfortable and, and 38 are somewhat comfortable. Um, we have you know, about a third that, that aren't really sure or definitely don't want us to, to call OSHA. Awesome. Ahead, Bridget. Great, so when we're talking about lockout tagout procedures, we're talking about preventing injuries and electrical injuries in the workplace with a proper control of energy procedure. 
We want to prevent arc flash and shock. And many people talk about arc flash and shock when it comes to electrical safety, but we should also be considering the dangers of equipment accidentally starting while somebody is maintaining that piece of equipment. So lockout tag out encompasses electrical safety, but it also encompasses other types of safety within the workplace so we can prevent more injuries. I'm going to be talking about Article 110, which is the general requirements for electrical safety work practices, Article 120, establishing an electrically safe work condition, and Article 130, which is work involving electrical hazards. So when we look into Article 110, the first thing that it starts to talk about is having an electrical safety program. So when the electrical safety program has to be implemented and it has to be documented, any kinds of new equipment um, need or modified equipment need to be inspected. Um, the maintenance of the equipment needs to be considered in the electrical safety program. There needs to be an awareness and self-discipline within all the workers that are involved in the electrical safety program. Um, principles that they should follow should be clear um, and how this electrical safety program is going to be monitored needs to be very clear. Um, the program procedures that everybody needs to follow need to be documented and, and obviously um, trained, the workforce needs to be trained in what those procedures are going to be. And there needs to be a risk assessment procedure. So anytime before electrical work is performed, firstly, all of the hazards need to be identified. Secondly, any risks that are involved in the work need to be assessed. And there needs to be good um, risk control methods employed to prevent injuries from those hazards in the workplace. Human error must be considered when planning any work. So we need to consider the potential for human error before we even start work and then implement a hierarchy of control methods every single time that we're going to do electrical work. So there needs to be a consideration of eliminating the hazard and or following procedures to prevent exposure to hazards and implementation of PPE. So your PPE would be your last line of defense against electrical hazards in the workplace. Um, it also talks about a job safety planning and briefing for everybody involved in the work, who is qualified to be around bare life conductors and who is not. Um, documentation of those hazards, and then a description of any tasks that are going to be performed, um, all of the electrical hazards in each task, um, a shock assessment, which we'll talk about um, in Article 130, and an arc flash assessment, um, work procedures, and any special precautions and energy source controls that are going to be implemented. All incidents that happen in the workplace need to be recorded and investigated. And then the electrical safety program should also be audited on a regular basis. So in terms of the program and how the people in the field are following the program, um, the lockout tag out procedures that are being implemented and how everything is being documented. So that's like, a lot of Article 110, but one of the really important things that Article 110 talks about is the training requirements. The difference between qualified electrical workers and non-qualified electrical workers. We've also got an arc flash and limited approach 
boundary that surrounds every bare live conductor. And it's, this limited approach boundary is very important when we're talking about qualified electrical workers and non-qualified electrical workers. So we have qualified electrical workers are trained in the construction and operation of equipment and trained to identify and avoid the electrical hazards that might be present. They're gonna be familiar with the proper use of precautionary techniques, um, PPE, insulating and shielding materials, insulating tools and equipment. They're considered qualified with respect to certain equipment tasks, but maybe not other equipment tasks. So there could be some people that are considered qualified to be within a limited approach boundary, but maybe not within the restricted approach boundary. So the type of training that each individual has needs to be considered when we're talking about an electrical safety program. Um, these electrical, electrically qualified workers are permitted to work within this limited approach boundary and they need to be trained. So they need to know about distinguishing all of the energized electrical circuit, sorry, conductors in a circuit and they need to have the skills and techniques necessary to determine the voltage of exposed energized electrical conductors. Um, and they need to know how to calculate what a limited approach boundary is. So this will be, we'll review this a little bit more when we talk about Article 130, but there's a, it changes depending on the voltage. Um, then they also need to know about how to assess the likelihood of an arc flash instead incident, which is also another part of 130. And they need a decision-making process necessary to perform the job planning, identify the electrical hazards, assess the risks, and select appropriate control methods. But unqualified people cannot enter this limited approach boundary. However, they still need to be trained to stay away from the limited approach boundary that the electrically qualified workers will implement into um, any kind of work that's being done. And then every two to three years, your electrically qualified workers need to be retrained in how to do all this. If there's any um, technology improvements or anything, they, they need to be trained in that when it happens. Um, and obviously we need to be observing how our electrically qualified workers are performing their electrical safety um, practices and are they documenting everything that they do um, and following safe lockout tagout procedures. Sometimes I run across um, host and contract employer responsibility confusion. So a host employer cannot just subcontract out to someone and absolve themselves of all risk when it comes to elect implementing electrical safety programs. A host employer is still responsible for informing contract employers of the known hazards, giving them information about the installation of equipment, and they need to observe whether their contract employees are in fact following electrical safety and safe lockout tagout practices. Then the contractor, the contract employer is responsible for implementing everything. But if they're not implementing safe work practices in the workplace, the host employer is meant to bring this up and document it when they discuss it with the contract employers. If you guys have any questions on Article 110, um, please feel free to um, type it in and, and Brent will answer your question if, if they can. I'm gonna move on to Article 120, which is establishing an electrically safe work condition and getting into the detail about a lockout tagout program. 
Um, Article 120 says the most effective way to prevent electrical injury is to completely remove the source of electrical energy and eliminate the possibility of its reappearance. To do so, workers must identify all possible sources of electricity and employ effective lockout tagout procedures. So then we're talking about lockout tagout programs. So there needs to be an establishment of a lockout tagout program. Um, and it needs to be implemented with specific procedures to safeguard the workers from exposure to electrical hazards. So it needs to be applicable to the experience and training of the workers, meet the requirements of Article 120, and apply to fixed permanently installed equipment, temporarily installed equipment, and portable equipment. So the program that everybody is following is clearly established, followed, and documented so that um, all workers have the appropriate training, they're audited, and their procedures are being followed. Moving into the principles of establishing an electrically safe work condition, we need to establish that electrical conductors and circuit parts shall not be considered to be in an electrically safe work condition until all requirements of this Article 120 are met. So we have to have safe work practices applicable to the circuit voltage and energy level used in accordance with the next Article 130 until such time that electrical conductors and circuit parts are in an electrically safe work condition. The employees need to be clear on this. The procedures that were established need to be followed. All of the sources of energy are identified before work starts, and then they're all established in an electrically safe work condition. So um, the types of lockout, tagout devices used are also very specific in this article. Um, there's complex lockout tagout and their simple lockout tagout. There needs to be um, a person in charge of a complex lockout tagout. An electrically qualified worker can, can be in charge of his own lockout tagout if it's a simple lockout tagout. But when we're looking at a, lo a complex lockout tagout, everybody involved in the work that in that involves electrical hazards needs to have their own lock that will be implemented and somebody has to be in charge of that operation to make sure that everybody is on the same page with what work is being done and the electrical hazards that they're going to be encountering the types of locks and tags. So these tags can't be like any other tag, it has to be clearly identifiable as a lockout tagout tag for hazardous energy. They can be similar to other forms of hazardous energy like hydraulic energy or any other type of stored energy that, that would be a hazard in the workplace, but lockout tagout tags need to be clearly identified so that everybody knows what it is and why it's there. Um, and the locks can either be a keyed or um, combination type lock. So then we talk about the procedures that everybody's following. So everybody needs to have a copy of the procedures and follow them every single time. There needs to be planning for every single job that's going to occur in an, a hazardous energy situation so that everybody knows how to locate the sources with drawings that are available to them, um, which people are gonna be exposed, um, who's in charge. Then with some operations where you're just testing or um, verifying zero energy for some type of work to be done, then all you need is an electrically qualified worker. So if you're doing any other kind of electrical work where people are going to be exposed to bare live conductors um, and 
hazardous electrical energy, we need to have a work permit and it's gonna to have to detail all of these procedures that are gonna be followed, all sources of energy, all hazards in the workplace. And then that work permit has to be approved before the work can even be done. But if you're just testing or verifying zero energy, then you can just have an electrically qualified worker do that. When we move on to 120.5, it actually has the, the full zero energy verification process um, for establishing an electrically safe work condition. So the first thing it tells you is that you have to determine all possible sources of electrical supply to the specific equipment, check the up-to-date drawings, diagrams, and identification tags. Then after you do that, you need to properly interrupt the load current. And it specifically says you have to open the disconnecting device for each source so that you can move on to number three, where it says you need to visually verify that all blades of the disconnecting device are fully open or that draw circuit breakers are withdrawn to the fully disconnected position. After that, we start talking about releasing stored electrical energy, releasing blocked um, mechanical energy that could be present. Then we're applying the lockout tagout devices with the procedures that have been established um, and using um, portable test instrument to test each phase conductor. And finally, there is a long drawn out process of reducing and of releasing induced voltages or stored electrical energy. So if you guys have any questions about Article 120, you can type them in and Brent will, will answer them. I'm going to move on to Article 130, which deals with work involving electrical hazards. So they'd like you to not work in electrically hazardous conditions, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And so this article tells you how to isolate your, yourself from hazardous electrical energy, um, and it establishes when you need PPE and when you don't need PPE. Um, and when you need to establish an electrically safe work condition. So in order to establish a, an electrically safe work condition, you're gonna need to know how to implement PPE. Um, you're going to need to know that anytime you're above 50 volts, then you're going to need PPE. And the type of PPE that's required will change as the, as the um, voltage changes. So you'll notice that the, the lady here, she's wearing a 480 volt type PPE. And then the guy in the next slide is wearing more PPE, a hood. So this is, the voltage is higher in this instance. However, this article also talks about when you don't need PPE. So if you're below 50 volts, then you don't need PPE. And if you're in a normal operating condition, you don't need PPE. So you may notice the guy in this photo doesn't have the extra electrical PPE on, and he is operating a, an electrical piece of an equipment. So the reason for that is that the door is closed. So if your equipment is properly installed and properly maintained, used in accordance with the instructions of the manufacturer and the doors are closed and secured or the equipment covers are in place and secured and there's no evidence of impending failure then you're considered in an electrically safe work condition there is no limited approach boundary around the conductors because they're not exposed um, so you don't need PPE and you don't need electrically qualified workers in those instances. If there are bare live conductors present, then you need to know that there is a limited approach boundary around each bare live conductor. 
and you're going to need to get an energized electrical work permit in order to conduct work that is going to require the procedures and the PPE before you begin the work. So um, again, if that work is just testing or verifying zero energy in order to say change out a motor or something, then an electrically qualified worker must do that, but you don't have to apply for a full work permit on that in that case. So all of these, we've talked about this limited approach boundary over and over and, and that it's important. There is a table in Article 130 that allows you to calculate what the limited approach boundary is around a particular exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part. It changes with the voltage. I have chosen a section in here for a lower voltage scenario because Meltric deals in low voltage electrical connectors that eliminate arc flash and shock. But here, this allows you to um, calculate what is that a limited approach boundary. Then we need to be able to look at the likelihood of an occurrence of an arc flash incident. So there are many different scenarios in this table, and I've chosen two. It again reinforces what a normal operation is. And if you're just going to operate a circuit breaker switch, contactor or starter, and the equipment condition is normal and the doors are closed and secured, then there's not a likelihood of an occurrence of an arc flash. But if you're opening any doors, removing any bolted covers and exposing bare energized electrical conductors and circuit parts, there's always a likelihood of an occurrence of an arc flash. And therefore you need to implement PPE. And there's another table in Article 130 that starts to talk about what type of PPE you'll need based on the voltage that's present. So now I'm just gonna talk about traditional pin and sleeve connectors and traditional disconnect switches. So you'll see that drawing an arc is always possible around any pin and sleeve device. They are not intended for disconnection under load. So there's always a limited approach boundary around a receptacle that is not covered because there are bare live conductors present. You need an electrically qualified worker to verify that we have an electrically safe work condition before disconnecting a pin and sleeve device if you're above 50 volts. So we need to verify zero energy with electrically qualified workers and be aware of a limited approach boundary around ener any energized receptacle that it has exposed bare life conductors. The other thing, this standard has specifically said that you, once you have disconnected the device, you need to open it and verify that all the phases have actually opened. So the reason why they have that in this standard is because there is an inherent hazard where you can hear that the disconnecting device is opened, but maybe one of the phases was stuck. There have been recalls in 2017 on a popular brand of bladed disconnects and I got this hazard warning off of that recall. There have also been recalls of popular brand of rotary disconnects. I have spoken to some of these manufacturers and they say that that is not typically the reason that these fail. They fail because of a lack of maintenance, because of corrosion on the contacts, and any kind of small animal that could get inside there. That could be insects, lizards, small rodents, and that they get in there and they get electrocuted and they stick that phase conductor. So there's always an inherent hazard that these could have failed. And then if somebody starts to perform work 
while that one phase is stuck, then they will be exposed to hazardous energy. So reliance on uh, or compliance with NFPA 70E, traditional switches and pin and sleeve connectors is going to rely on qualified personnel, procedures, and PPE. So this guy again is wearing the typical PPE required for a 480 volt condition that would reduce and lower energy and increase if there's a higher amount of energy present. There are many violations of this code and that's what um, people typically get um, cited for. Sometimes it's just because they didn't inspect new or modified equipment. But these are the most common violations. And I have personally seen these myself. A lot of people just open the disconnecting device. They don't ever open it. They just throw the switch and trust that it's operated safely. And then they start their work. And as we've learned that the switch can fail in one of the phase conductors. I've seen people not use PPE when they're exposed to bare live conductors. And that is inherent in this standard that if you're ex ever exposed to bare live conductors and you're above 50 volts, then you need PPE. Um, unqualified workers that don't know what limited approach boundaries are, let alone how to calculate them, are often found within the limited and restricted approach boundaries within the workplace. And these guys aren't aware of the electrical hazards. They're not fully aware of arc flash and shock hazards with bare life conductors and the different kinds of PPE that are required for them. So it's not fully their fault that they are being exposed to these electrical hazards. We have another poll question for you. According to the NFPA 70E standard for electrical safety in the workplace, what is the most effective risk control method? PPE, substitution, engineering controls, elimination, or administrative controls? I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer that question and Jim will give us a result. Hey, I think we got um, as many responses as we're going to receive, um, but we had uh, uh, interesting. We had 87 um, say elimination, and we had 13% say PPE. So I'll, I'll Bridget, I'll let you explain why that that's interesting. So that's interesting because the NFPA 70E standard says the best way is to eliminate the hazards. So we wanna physically remove the hazard from the workplace rather than replace the hazard, isolate people from the hazard, um, follow administrative controls and lock out, tag out, or utilize PPE. We wanna eliminate it so nobody has to worry about it and we don't have to um, worry about workers following standards because there's the potential for human error in every administrative control scenario. So what Maltrick does is eliminate the hazards. So I am going to stop sharing my screen for just a second and show you how we do that. So when you did disconnect a Maltrick device, 
It disconnects in 15 milliseconds. There's an arc flash chamber inside so that it is the worker is never exposed to the potentiality of an arc flash hazard. And then when you rotate the device to disconnect it, you've activated a dead front shutter. And what that dead front shutter does is isolate you from bare life conductors. So there's never a risk of shock. So we've eliminated those two hazards from the workplace, the arc flash and the shock hazard. We can lock out tag out very easily here on the plug, or you can get an extra lockout hole on the receptacle. So I'll start sharing again. Um, okay. Moving on to my next slide. So now if you have eliminated the hazards, then you don't need electrically qualified workers in the moment. So when we're talking about reduced downtimes, you know, the mechanic just grabs a new motor off the shelf and can verify his own zero energy when he unplugs the Meltric device. So now he's not exposed to bare live conductors. So we don't have to worry about him being injured. It's not gonna completely eliminate the need for an electrically qualified worker because somebody is gonna have to pre-wire and pre-bump the motor and have it on the shelf in the moment. But that reduced downtime is very important to operations and maintenance guys in industry. So the lockout tag out is drastically simplified with Meltric devices. And we can follow NFPA 70E standard without worrying about human error. We have a free product offer for you guys if you'd like to try our product before you buy it. Um, you're gonna have your easy lockout tag out capabilities. Your zero energy verification is gonna be that air gap in between all of the conductors. You're gonna have complete protection from live parts and art clash and a quick way to make and break connections. We can provide you with a DSN 20 or a DSN 30 free of charge. Just let us know. Thank you very much for attending the webinar today. Um, I thought I'd mention that we still have industry leading de delivery times. We've got worldwide availability and a five-year electrical warranty on all of our products. If you have any questions, you can type them in and Brent will endeavor to answer you. Um, but that's it from me today. Oh, we'll keep the we'll keep it open for about 30 more seconds or so. We don't see any questions coming in. Um, you can also always just reach out to us and we can answer the questions. Um, offline as well. Okay, we did get a question. Um, Brent, I'll let you answer this, um, but you might as well do it verbally. Are plugs and receptacles rated for load break. Yes, they are. <laughs> Meltric is both a switch and a plug-in receptacle. Okay, everyone, we're going to shut it down. It seems like questions have been posed and answered. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we appreciate it, and everyone have a wonderful day.